Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse number 13, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 9, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Receiving all of the news this morning in the last couple of days and has obviously got our hearts very heavy. I just a few moments ago, as you right before service, learned of another loss, major loss in our church family here at Hickory Knoll. And although the sermon this morning is going to vary slightly from what was originally planned, I will say that I was very thankful to know that our text this morning comes out of Matthew 26 and deals with something that we participate in every first day of the week, something that keeps us grounded, something that keeps us focused, something that keeps our hearts in tune when we are at a loss, when we don't know what to say, when we do not know what to do. I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Matthew 26. We are going to focus for a few moments this morning on verses 26 through 29 as Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Already in chapter number 26, Jesus has been prepping the disciples for what is about to happen. He is going to be telling them and teaching them about how there is going to be one who betrays the Son of Man. Then beginning in verse number 17, Jesus begins talking about the past over feast. And the Passover, of course, was something that was a part of the Old Testament. The Passover was an annual reminder, Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8, of what the Lord was able to do for the people as they were coming out of Egyptian bondage. The Passover, as you recall from Exodus 12, reminds us that the Lord spared the lives of his people. The Lord passed over those who had the blood on the doorpost. And because of God's love and his salvation, the people of God were able to get through that horrendous moment of bondage and to make their way to the promised land of Canaan to live a life of salvation, to live a life of freedom, to live a life anticipating that there is much more to come than what we know of in our lives. But in Matthew 26, this last supper or this last Passover was particularly important because this occurred during the final week in which Jesus was alive before his death, burial, and resurrection. This is the Thursday before, just right before all of the events at Calvary were going to transpire. And on this day, on this last supper, as the disciples are focused on the Passover and what God had done in the past, Jesus is directing their attention to what the Lord our God the Father is about to do in the present that will impact us forever in the future. In Matthew chapter 26, verse number 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then Jesus took the cup and gave thanks and gave to it to them saying, drink from it all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new 
with you in my Father's kingdom. The message this morning was titled, is titled, More Precious Than Diamonds. And as we think about those items in our lives that are most precious to us, whether it's our engagement rings, whether it's our families, whether it is the most expensive item that we can imagine, we know that there is nothing more precious than Jesus Christ. We know that there is nothing more precious than his body being crucified on the cross and his blood being shed. This has nothing to do with luck or chance. Rather, it has everything to do with his love. His love that laid his life down for us and his love that was demonstrated in his death on the cross and his resurrection to free us from any wrath or eternal punishment, to enable us to be able to spend one day in heaven with him. This morning, for your consideration, as we think about the Lord's Supper, as we think about the body of Jesus on the cross and his blood that was shed, I'd like to make three observations this morning, and hopefully these observations will be helpful helpful in our further understanding what this awesome opportunity we have to come together to worship our God. Yes, to sing songs of praise to Him. Yes, to hear the Word of God proclaimed. Yes, to pray to Him. And yes, to give back as we have been prospered. But ultimately, the reason why we are coming on the first day of the week to worship Him is because what He has done for us. And through the Lord's Supper, we remember His body being on the cross and His blood being shed. I invite you to go now. We'll come back to Matthew 26 later. But I'd invite you to go now to the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse number seven in particular, but we'll look at some items that were going on. The Apostle Paul in Acts 20 is on one of his missionary journeys, and he's actually in a hurry, and that's the indication that he has is making his way over to Jerusalem. But what is fascinating, as we see in verses 6 and 7, is that Paul, even though he was in a hurry to get to Jerusalem, he waited nearly or just about an entire week for a particular occasion to occur. In Acts 20, verse number 6, it says, But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. This passage reminds us, first of all, that as we think of the Lord's Supper, this is something we are to do on, number one, a weekly basis basis. We do the Lord's Supper. We celebrate His death, His burial, His resurrection. We do this in remembrance of Him on a weekly basis. Now Paul evidently was not, and obviously not just waiting for, waiting around here in, uh, in Acts 20 verse number 7, just to wait for the next meal or just to wait for the next fellowship opportunity to, to chew the fat or to say, see how you're doing or to even teach another lesson. But Paul is waiting there so that he can be with the Christians on the first day of the week to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And we get every indication in verse number, in verse number seven that the purpose, the sole purpose, the primary purpose is on the first day of the week, this idea of when the disciples, when the first day comes, we gather together to commemorate the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. 
I realize that there are a lot of religious groups that only take of the Lord's Supper on occasion. I know there's a lot of folks professing to be Christians that only take the Lord's Supper once or twice a year. But we come every first day of the week and we celebrate what Jesus has done for us. It is a weekly observance every week, every first day of the week. Now there are some of our religious friends and neighbors who sometimes they feel as if they can receive the Lord's Supper on Saturday evening or just any other day of the week. But what we understand is that when we remove the Lord's Supper from the first day of the week, we take it away from the reason why it was originally celebrated on the first day. It's celebrated on the first day of the week because this is when Jesus has arisen from the grave. And we know that he died, yes, but he is alive. And we celebrate this every first day of the week. Secondly, as we go now to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. As we think of the Lord's Supper, not only do we need to do so on a weekly basis, but second, we also need to do so in a worthy manner. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23 The apostle says, For I received from the Lord that that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The Lord's Supper is a big deal. It's not just the transition away from the sermon up to the announcements. But the Lord's Supper is the most important, it's the most significant thing that all of what we do. Sometimes folks say, well, I, I'm going to church, so I, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to stay for the preaching. Well, that is great and that is awesome. But what we're doing is staying for the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is what is most important. And as we take it as an, as an individual, we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine our hearts. We need to examine our minds. We need to examine our lives. We've got to think about all the things we've done this past week. And we've got to think about all the things we've got planned for this coming week. And as we examine ourselves and as we partake in a worthy manner, we've got to make sure that during this moment of the Lord's Supper, we've got to make sure that this is not the only moment in our week that we reflect upon what Jesus has done for us. But in order to do so in a worthy manner, yes, while the Lord's Supper is occurring, we focus on what Jesus has done for us, but that focus should be a continuation of every other day of our lives. We don't take the Lord's Supper every day. We take it on the first day of the week, but as we examine ourselves, we make look at our lives and our hearts and our minds and we say, all right, I need to come with a clean slate I need to repent of all of my sins that I've committed 
this past week. I need to have a stronger faith than when those, when that bread is passed around, when that fruit of the vine is passed around. We are making a proclamation until Jesus comes again that we believe that he died on the cross, that he was buried, and he was resurrected from the grave. Partaking of the Lord's Supper is something we do individually, and we strive to do so in a worthy manner. But third, and maybe most relevant and applicable for us this morning as brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, we partake of the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis. Yes, we strive to do so individually in a worthy manner. But third, as we turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're mindful that we are not in this by ourselves, but that we are communing with the Lord, not simply as an individual, but with our family in Christ. As I begin reading in verse number 14, going down to verse 24, I invite you to notice how many times the word we appears in this text. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh, are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar. What am I saying then, that an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything? But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot, verse 21, drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. Let no one seek his own, but each other well being. There is a we factor in the Lord's Supper. And this we-ness involves you and I. It involves us as brothers and sisters in Christ, as one family. We are reminded this morning that there is nothing certain in life. We are reminded this morning that life is fragile. We are reminded this morning that there is so much unknown in this world that if we allow all of that to get caught up in us, then we will lose our way. We will lose our faith and we will be lost forever. However, in the Lord's beautiful design and his wonderful plan of salvation includes weekly worship as together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And just for a few moments, every first day of the week, we come here in this safe place, this safe place spiritually away from the world. We come together here in this safe place to know that everything is going to be okay. We come together in this safe place to know that even though there's a bunch of uncertainty in life, there is a whole lot of certainty in Christ. We come together in this safe place to know that even though that there is death in this life, we come together and remind it that there is life 
after death. And we come together in this safe place as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we consider each other's well-being. This is why we do not worship in our homes by ourselves. But we worship together. And it's not simply something that I individually do with the Lord. But it's something collectively that I do with his entire body. The church. And we do so in a weekly on a weekly basis, reflecting upon our own lives and reminded as we commune together with the Lord that we are not by ourselves and that we are not in this alone. But as we celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection, we are reminded that yes, death feels terrible, But resurrection feels awesome. And we know that we look forward to that day in which all of us will experience a resurrection from the grave. In the same way that Jesus resurrected on the first day of the week, we too one day will resurrect from the grave. As we bring all of this Together, I invite you now to go back to Matthew 26. Notice again verse number 29 of Matthew 26. Jesus says, after instituting the the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine and connecting it to his body and to his blood, Jesus says in verse 29, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now granted, there are a couple of plausible explanations of what Jesus is talking about and one, to one extent, we could say that, yes, Jesus is his father's kingdom is the church. And we can say to an extent that together as Christians in the church, as we partake of this Lord's Supper, that the Lord is with us in our midst, that we are doing this in remembrance of him, and that we know that our worship to the Lord is not just going up into empty air, But the Lord is with us as we are here this morning, worshiping in spirit and in truth. But it may very well be the case, and I, to be rather honest, lean more to this second possibility of what Jesus is saying here. Yes, I firmly believe that the kingdom is the church and that we are a part of the Lord's kingdom now. We are a part of the Lord's church But there is also indication in Scripture that the kingdom is also heavenly as well. That there is the kingdom of heaven. And as you think about when the Lord's church began, follow me on this thought for just a moment as we wrap up. You think about when the Lord's church began. It was on the day of Pentecost. Remember, Jesus had risen from the first, on the first day of the week, and the day of Pentecost was approximately seven Sundays after that. It was 50, 50 days or so after, and Jesus has already ascended into heaven. And so when the church began on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, Jesus is already in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And so when he says in verse 29, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom, he may very well be talking about heaven. He may very well be talking about the great marriage feast. Over in Revelation chapter 19, verse number 9, The scripture says, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus is, in the book of John, it's being recorded about what's going to happen on that day when Jesus comes 
Again, these are the true sayings of God. We learned of the death of Brother Nunnery just a, a few days ago. And I remember last Sunday morning after Bible study, I talked to him and I, I asked him, are you ready for that grass to start growing? And he says, I'm ready. I, I'm ready to get out there and cut that grass. And the, ma- the last memory I have of Brother Nunnery is that big smile that he was so famous for. And he was thinking about, obviously, the grass growing, but he was also thinking about, as he does every Sunday, being with his brothers and sisters in Christ. And I remember all kinds of things about Brother Nunnery that will hang on for a long time. But one of the things that I always remember is his, his prayers, how genuine and how sincere they were. Brother Nunnery often was thankful to the Lord for being with us last night as we slept and slumbered, not even knowing what side of the living we were on. And Brother Nunnery in his prayers often said, we thank you God for waking us up this morning and allowing us to see another day. Well, Brother Nunnery is sleeping and slumbering in the Lord's right now. But imagine what it would be like on that day when the dead in Christ will rise and those Christians who are still alive will meet the Lord in the air. Imagine what it will be like on that day when there will be no funeral repast, rather a marriage feast in heaven. Imagine what it will be like on that day when we drink of the fruit of the vine in Jesus's king, in the Father's kingdom of heaven forever. And imagine on that day what it would be like to see the smile on Brother Nunnery's face. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to that day of, of reuniting with all of our loved ones who are Christians. I'm looking forward to that day of reuniting with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We've had too many deaths lately, but as Christians in faith, we're holding on to a better day. Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body. Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Communing with the Lord, yes, this is more precious than diamonds, has nothing to do with luck, but everything to do with love. But until that day when Jesus comes again, or when it is our time to part this world, we partake of the Lord's Supper, proclaiming His death until He comes. We do so on a weekly basis, in a worthy manner, and we do so together as one family with one interest And that is to proclaim the death of Jesus and his resurrection till he comes again. This morning as we sing this song of encouragement, we want everyone to know that life is not certain, that death is imminent. That in Hebrews 9 verse 27 it says that there is appointed a day for once for man to die and then the judgment. We do not have any guarantee of tomorrow, but we do have this moment right now to make sure that our lives are right with God, that we have confessed our belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that we have repented of our sins, and that we, as Romans 6 teaches, have been buried with Him in baptism, connecting to that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our Lord. This morning, if we can help you to become a Christian or to be restored to the Lord, we invite you to come right now while together we stand and sing.